Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil Reacts. I'm Mike King. I want to go back to July 24th, 1984. Ron and Dan Lafferty thought their God wanted them to kill their sister-in-law and her 14-month-old daughter, a little girl named Erica. According to Ron, it had to be by the blade similar to sacrifices found in ancient scripture. And, the, and as Ron spoke for their God, he directed his younger brother, Dan, to be the arm of God. He was the one that was assigned to complete the deed. The death scene would shock a community and the police officers who responded to the bloody scene. Books and stories have been written about this thing, but it would actually take years after the trial and the conviction for the killer to share his inner thoughts and feelings about the crime. I was able to get and record that confession, and I'm going to share parts of it today, with the killer's permission now 37 years after the crime. Well, I hope you'll take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button, and ring the bell so that you get all the notifications from Profiling Evil. Now, let's travel back to July 24th, 1984. Now, I got to warn you, this one could be a tough one for some of you. And so please consider whether you want to learn about what happened or not. You know me, I'm not going to be showing gruesome crime scene photos, but I will be talking plainly about what happened. It's not going to be sensationalized. And I hope that you've all just become accustomed to my style and, and you'll be comfortable sticking around. July 24th is a statehood holiday in Utah. In 1847, a group of pioneers entered the Salt Lake Valley led by Brigham Young. They were completing their 1,300-mile journey across the American Plains. It was at that time that Brigham Young declared, this is the place. Let's look at the stain of murder that the Lafferty's added to this day in history. Again, a day that should be a day of celebration in the state. This is the story of their ritualistic murder spree that left their sister-in-law, and her 14-month-old baby dead. The Lafferty brothers, as they would come to be known, claimed to be prophets of a God that they believe sanctioned murder. They, they would end up committing a crime in a quiet neighborhood inside the confines of their brother's little rambler home. The, the Deseret News would quote American Fort Police Chief Terry Fox as saying, Quote, I'm sure the old-time residents remember. It's one of those threshold events that people just don't forget, close quote. Terry and I actually worked together on patrol graveyard shifts many years earlier than that at the Ogden Police Department. <clears throat> I would end up at the Attorney General's office, and he would later become the police chief in this little town where the murders occurred. He was a detective at the time that the murders occurred, but but speaking of that day, a neighbor of the victims actually said, quote, I don't think I'll ever forget. My blood ran cold that day, close quote. The murders just didn't make sense to anyone. The crime was fueled by the religious beliefs of Ron and Dan Lafferty, two crazy guys who believed they were prophets, perhaps even gods. Now, I've investigated religious fanatics for most of my career, but it was these two that I would end up spending hundreds of hours interviewing from their prison cells. In fact, I'm going to share some of the interviews with you. This is the first time they've ever been made public, and some are from a few years after the murders occurred. Others are just taken a few months ago as I interviewed Dan Lafferty in the Utah State Prison, a place where he's been since 1984-85. He was brought out of maximum security one time in the mid-1990s for three days. I know this because I'm the one that got him out. I loaded him in a state-owned twin-engine plane, and we flew to Phoenix, Arizona, where we had him speak to a room of a 1,000 violent crime investigators at a national conference. It was there that the killer spoke of the murders, and he answered questions for hours. Now, before I show some of these... I want to lay out what happened, but I want to first start with a news story that I recorded on my VCR way back then when the preliminary hearings were happening. I believe it was KSL television and the reporter was Robert Wall. Let's watch. 
One of the state's most critical pieces of evidence in its case against Ron and Dan Lafferty is this handwritten document, which the Lafferty's believe is a revelation from God. Police obtained the document through a search warrant and gave the Lafferty brothers a copy to aid in preparing their defense. The document lists the names of four individuals who should be removed in rapid succession. The names listed were thy brother's wife Brenda and her baby, then Chloe Lowe, a former neighbor of Ron Lafferty, then Richard Stowe, an LDS official in Ron Lafferty's former stake. The Lafferty brothers say they gave the letter to a Daily Herald reporter as part of their strategy, but do not feel the document proves they are guilty. That revelation was not directed to me or to Dan directly, and the word kill or murder is not used in that revelation whatsoever. In fact, uh, I'll tell you the word that's being used there. There is a word that is used, that's, and the word is remove. I think most of you are familiar with that word. It was, I believe, read uh, at the preliminary hearing. Deputy County Attorney Wayne Watson has been prosecuting the case and says he was surprised to see the document on the front page of today's paper. Watson feels its release to the public just prior to the selection of a jury was not in good taste, and he feels it plays into the hands of the defendants. I think that it was one of the most irresponsible acts of journalism I've ever seen. To, to publish or print a critical piece of state's evidence that they know is state's evidence and to put it on the front page of a newspaper that circulates in the area where the jury panel is going to come from I think is irresponsible. Watson says it will still be possible to impanel an impartial jury but feels it will be much harder to find people whose minds have not been prejudiced by the media. The review of potential jurors in the murder case will begin on Monday. Robert Walls, Eyewitness News, Central Utah. The Lafferty's grew up in a little community south of Salt Lake City in the American Fork area. The family was large and consisted of a couple of daughters and six boys. Their father's name was Watson, and he was, by all accounts, a strict and disciplined man. Dan once told me that his father, who was a chiropractor, was abusive and strict. He said that Watson took religious doctrine to an extreme, and he used it as a mechanism for control in the home. He would often direct his anger with Claudine on the children or on family pets. Dan told me that he watched his father beat a family dog to death with a baseball bat one night. The Lafferty brothers were taught from an early age that relying upon modern medicine was against God's wishes. The family didn't trust the government. They lived as constitutionalists, and Ron and Dan were so influenced by their father that they kept that belief system, including becoming chiropractors. They were educated. On one occasion, one of the Lafferty boys actually shot himself in the stomach with an arrow when they were kids. Now, something like this would normally warrant a trip to an emergency room, but it was Sunday, so the boy would have to suffer until Monday morning before his parents would take him in for treatment. This is according to Dan. Their mother, Claudine, was unique as well. Dan would say that he loved her, but he acknowledged that he thought she was a little bit crazy. Now, whether crazy or not, I don't know, but she did manipulate her sons and use them against her husband. She protected them, though, whenever her husband was mad at them. The boys held Claudine in high esteem because she treated them so well. In fact, Dan says that she treated Ron better. In fact, almost looked at him like he was a husband of sorts. That was, I'm sure, frustrating for Watson. Well, I, I remember sitting with Dan Lafferty at the Utah State Prison. We were eating some prison lasagna and talking about his childhood. He told me about a strange ritual that they would go through as a family when the family gathered around the table each night for dinner. His mother, Claudine, would hold up a needle attached to a foot-long piece of thread and dangle it over the food. Now, now I want you to picture this in your mind. Do you, do you remember playing with uh, the Ouija board as a kid? Uh, some people call them spirit boards. The purpose was that you would ask the Ouija board questions, and the spirit in the room would move the pointer around so that you'd get an answer. Now, keep that in mind. Dan said that as they sat to eat dinner, and again, we're sitting over prison lasagna, he said his mom would hold the needle hanging from thread up, and then the family would gather around the table, 
and they would start praying and Claudine would hold the needle, which would start to swing and it would swing over the food as they prayed. And that would give them the idea of what food they should eat first and the order that they should eat from that point on. So once the spirits had identified how they were to eat that night, the family could dig in. Now, I hope that helps you kind of understand a little bit of what was going on there. It was with that bizarre slant toward religious fanaticism that uh, the Lafferty's father led the family to never decide anything without first praying about it, including whether to, to turn right or left as they headed to the Piggly Wiggly. Well, with that same gusto came the warning to distrust conventional medicine and the federal government that extended into local government. Subconsciously, the boys were nurturing seeds of paranoia, rebellion, and fanaticism. I think anybody growing up in such a controlled and weird environment uh, is going to have problems fitting in with peers in the neighborhood or in school. Thus, Ron and Dan became best friends. But, but they were known in the neighborhood for having short tempers. And if one of the boys ended up in a fight, the other one was soon in the fight backing up his brother. Well, as they grew older, Ron developed this belief that he was a prophet of his God. Soon, Dan adopted the same belief, and the two of them quit their mainstream religious beliefs and secretly started their own church. They grew beards, like the prophets of old from the Bible. They created a training academy of sorts to teach the other men who had like-minded thoughts about things how they could eventually become prophets. And their little group started growing. Ron married, and he soon began a family, but he believed in polygamy, or, or at least this idea of having multiple wives. His bizarre beliefs had him in trouble with the church that he belonged to, and his wife didn't agree with it. Dan also married and, and espoused similar kinds of beliefs, but as the two boys grew older, they picked up many of their father's idiosyncrasies, according to Dan. Now, I don't know any other way to say this than they were just plain weird about some things. For instance, instead of buying baby food, Dan would chew food up into a mush, <laughs> get this, and then spit it into the mouths of his children to eat. Well, as the brothers took their fanaticism to the extreme, they continued to feed into each other. They stopped paying taxes, and, and they even quit obeying things like traffic laws. Ron actually successfully ran for city council, but he thought the government was still too involved in people's lives. In fact, he was so far to the edge that he refused to use city garbage services in opting to haul his own trash to the dump. He lived off the grid before living off the grid was popular. Dan's focus on polygamy intensified and he attempted to marry his own 14-year-old daughter as part of this fundamentalist belief system. Well, along the way, he became angry with the criminal justice system, and he, in fact, became so angry that he tried to run for a Utah County Sheriff. Thankfully, he lost. Now, Ron believed in polygamy, but he knew that the church he belonged to didn't approve of it, and his wife certainly didn't agree to practice it. So instead, he became a writer of religious beliefs and interpretations of Scripture. As the church they belonged to became aware of their bizarre uh, personal and religious beliefs, they were eventually excommunicated. It was shortly after that that their wives filed for divorce. It was then that Ron declared that he was, quote, the voice of the Lord, and that Dan was the, quote, arm of the Lord, close quote. Dan was thrilled with the position of power it supposedly gave him. Now, Ron was very angry at, at his wife for leaving him, but more angry at Brenda, his sister-in-law, who backed her up. He was mad at church members who supported her in their divorce. So as they continued to preach their destructive doctrine to friends and family members, uh, they started to, to talk out about Brenda and other members of the church. 
Now, Brenda, the wife of their youngest brother, Alan, forbade her husband from continuing association with the pair. She knew they were crazy. Well, this only angered Ron and Dan, who prayed for inspiration on how to handle her. And the God they were worshiping gave them inspiration. Alan's wife, Brenda, was an intelligent, confident woman. She had uh, been a former beauty queen. Uh, She was a college graduate. She worked at Brigham Young University as a news anchor. And as she continued to speak out against the brothers' beliefs that they were prophets, Ron was busy creating revelation to quiet her for good. And and while she may have stripped his wife from the self-proclaimed zealot, Ron was resolute that Brenda wouldn't tear apart the Lafferty brothers. You know, I re-listened to a recording I have of Brenda speaking with a friend on the phone. And she was talking to her about her concerns for one of the wives of the other brothers in the Lafferty family. In the conversation, she states, quote, Is she aware that her life is in jeopardy? Close quote. It was so clear that Brenda was aware of how out of control the brothers were becoming with these ritualistic ideals that they had. But little did she know that she was the real target of their aggression. Ron's power and control in the family was evident, and the six Lafferty brothers grew closer, finding common ground in their belief that Ron actually might be a prophet. In March of 1984, just a few months before the murders, Ron recorded his removal revelation. He documented it on a yellow legal pad that was later collected as evidence. He claimed it was revelation directly from God, and the first place he shared it was with his brothers and other close confidants at this school of the prophets they'd created. The word sent shivers down the spines of everyone in attendance except Dan. The revelation read, quote, Thus saith the Lord unto my servants, the prophets, It is my will and commandment that ye remove the following individuals in order that my work might go forward, for they have become obstacles in my path, and I will not allow my work to be stopped. First, thy brother's wife Brenda and her baby, then Chloe Lowe, and then Richard Stowe, and it is my will that they be removed in rapid succession, close quote. And with his premeditation of murder clearly on the table, he began planning. Now, it would take almost two months until Ron was angry enough to pull off the four murders that he believed this should happen. The brothers started getting rid of personal possessions and laying the groundwork for this crime. Let's listen as Dan describes why he agreed to speak to investigators about this quick case and what led up to the murders. I want you to listen closely as he leads into the murders. You're going to hear and you might even see him almost smile as he relives the experience. Let's watch. From my understanding, I was told that it was so that you'd be able to make some analysis possibly for uh, the understanding of the criminal mind. Now, I told him I was, I'd had a premonition that there was just something that needed to be done. And I sold all my weapons in a garage sale. And incidentally, from that garage sale, my brother took some of the money and he bought some items at the mall there in Pro, the University Mall one of which was the knife which ultimately was used to, uh, to take the lives of these two individuals. So on the 24th of July, okay, I'll get into, this is getting pretty, this will be pretty intense now, so just kind of brace yourself if you need to. Uh, I'm not ashamed of it, I'm not embarrassed by it, and I may speak of it so calmly that uh, it might unnerve you a little bit, but it's, to me, there was no emotional involvement, and I, in fact, well, I'll tell you, I'll describe how it happened, and uh, it is a phenomenon that I don't understand completely. Uh, it raises a lot of interesting questions in my own mind about God and about... Dan was the only brother who remained faithful to Ron's delusions. But he was accompanied by two newcomers. Charles, a guy that went by Chip Carnes of New, uh, New Mexico, and a guy named Ricky Martin Knapp of Wichita, Kansas. 
The other four brothers didn't participate in the murders, and I, I still don't have a good grasp on what they knew or what they didn't know about things. But one brother challenged Ron about the need to kill 14-month-old Erica, saying, you know, babies don't get in the way of God's work. Ron responded by showing a pearl-handled knife and as he mumbled that it would be an instrument for removing the wicked in the last days. Carnes would later testify that he had only known the Lafferty's for two weeks and that they actually picked him up on a road where his car had broken down. Well, on the night before the slaying, he said that the four men, Ron, Dan, Ricky, and Carnes, sat in a Bible discussion meeting in uh, Ron and Dan's mother, Claudine's home. During the discussion, Dan asked Ron again, why can't we just shoot Brenda? To which Ron replied, quote, the Lord has commanded that their throats be slashed, close quote. Well, I've never heard why July 24th was the day selected for the murders. It, it happened early in the morning hours as the four men loaded into Lafferty's green station wagon. It had a luggage rack on top, and they strapped a red cooler to the rack filled with necessities to, to get them through what they knew would be a rather long day. They stopped first at one of the brothers' homes to pick up some guns, and they, they left with a shotgun. They also wanted the brother's deer rifle, but he said he had loaned it to one of the other brothers. As they loaded their vehicle and prepared to leave their brother's house, he asked, well, what do you intend to hunt? Ron stared at him and replied, any blankety blank thing that gets in my way. After driving away, they went to Claudine's house where Ron ordered that the barrel of the shotgun be cut off, stating that the gun would be really good for killing cops. Claudine reportedly told them not to have guns in her home, but then she relented and said, okay, it's okay since you've already cut the barrel off. Well, almost a hundred miles away, Lafferty's brother, Alan, Brenda's husband, was at a job site working. According to those close to the case, it was outside of normal behavior for him to be working on a holiday. Now, again, remember, Alan is Brenda's husband, the father of Erica, two of the intended murder victims. If you recall, Brenda had forbade her husband's interactions with Ron and Dan, calling them crazy. Now, Alan complied with his wife's wishes, at least publicly, and Dan forcefully protects his brother to this day, saying that Alan didn't know what they were going to do. Now, I still find that odd that Alan chose to work on that specific day, a holiday. I pressed Dan multiple times about this, and he never changed his story. Dan remains firm that Alan didn't know anything of their plans. Except for, he said, we did mention four months earlier that Brenda needed to be killed. I stopped Dan as we talked. I said, what, what do you mean, Dan? His reply was that everybody knew that Brenda and the baby, as well as two other people from the neighborhood and the local church, had been identified as targets for murder. Allen would later tell police that he challenged Ron on this concept, but he eventually told his old, older brother that he would just have to pray about whether it was God's will or not that Brenda should die. Well, according to Dan, the issue was never discussed again. It troubled me then, and it still does today. When interviewed after the murders, Allen told police that he and Brenda were intimate at 2.30 in the morning on the day of her death. He woke her up in the middle of the night to do so. He said it was out of character for them to do something like that. And then he left that morning to work some 70 miles to the north. At 1.30 in the afternoon, this is important, at 1.30 in the afternoon, he called Brenda and he asked her what she was wearing. He then asked to speak to the baby Erica for a moment, and after chatting, said goodbye. As Ron and Dan Lafferty, accompanied by Carnes and Knapp, sat in Lafferty's childhood home, cutting the barrel off of that shotgun. You remember the shotgun that Ron said would be great for killing cops? Now, Carnes, this guy who went by the nickname Chip, noted 
that when they left Claudine's house, it was exactly 1.30 p.m. They started their drive toward Brenda's home. And as they drove, he recalled uh, Dan asking Ron one more time if the throats of the two had to be slit. And again, wondered, why can't we just shoot them? Well, Ron was adamant that it had to be ritualistic and by the blade of his newly purchased knife. Well, as they pulled the green station wagon into Alan Lafferty's driveway, Ron turned and told Knapp and Carnes to stay in the car and keep a lookout. Ron grabbed the pearl-handled knife as they exited the vehicle and he walked toward the front door. They pounded on the door of the house, but Brenda never answered. They returned to the vehicle and they left. Well, as they drove away, Ron suddenly snapped and he ordered Knapp to turn the car around and go back, stating, quote, the hell with it. I feel like doing it. I feel good about it, close quote. Well, as they approached the front door, Brenda peered out and said, I can't let you in. Just then, Dan forced his way into the home and a violent struggle took place. Carnes and Knapp would later testify that they could hear Brenda screaming from the vehicle. They heard her yelling, I'll never do it again, as she pled for forgiveness from the brothers. These two uh, associates to this crime testified also that whatever was going on in the house caused the front door and the windows to shake. They heard the baby screaming, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. They heard Brenda scream repeatedly, please don't hurt my baby. And then everything went quiet. What was proven in court, though, through physical evidence, crime scene photographs, and forensics was backed up by additional testimony. What really happened is once inside the home, Ron and Dan violently beat Brenda while the baby cried for her mommy. Once unconscious, they wrapped the vacuum cord around Brenda's neck. And then Dan went in and executed the 14-month-old. After killing Erica, Dan calmly removed the cord from Brenda's neck and then executed her just as his brother had instructed. He casually walked into the bathroom and washed the knife in his hands and the two brothers slipped out of the back sliding door. Just minutes later, Ron and Dan walked back to the station wagon. Testimony says they were covered in blood. As they sat down, Ron spoke to Dan and said, Hey, thanks for taking the baby. I couldn't have done that. Dan simply replied, No problem. Well, the killers would be arrested days later, and, and you can read more about this, this crime online and the arrest, because instead, I want to break from my narrative and let you just hear from the killer himself as he speaks about the event. Now, remember that uh, one of the accomplices to murder testified in court that he could hear the baby crying for her mother, and he could hear Brenda pleading with the, the Lafferty's to not hurt her baby. Well, in this confession or statement now by the killer, you'll hear him describe how the baby was calm and that everything happened like it was supposed to. In fact, you're going to hear Dan Lafferty describe how he thinks the baby thought he was her father, and their voices really do sound very close to, to each other. Let's listen in. And I'm going to take the child's life. And he said, how are you going to do it? I said, just a minute, let me see what I feel. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to use a knife to take their lives. It got pretty uh, unpleasant. Uh, blood was splattered at that point, quite, started to be splattered quite severely, actually. And that's why, if you've seen the pictures of this crime scene, there, were, there was blood splattered on the wall. We were kind of in the alcove right there by her neck, so I was satisfied that she wouldn't regain consciousness. And walked right into the child's room. The baby was standing in the bed. And uh, I really believe that the baby thought that I was, his, uh, was her father because uh, her father and I have identical voices. We both had beards and such. So I began, uh, I, had a, I talked to her briefly. I said, I don't understand this completely. I, I, I understand from what I'm being directed that you need to go back 
I told her, and I don't think she understood any of this, but it was important for me. I felt I had to do this anyway. I said, I don't understand it. Maybe we can talk about it sometime in the presence of God. I don't know. I says, but it, it's imperative, apparently, that you be, uh, you leave this world. And so I, I put my left hand on her head, and then I uh, raised the knife with my right hand, and I closed my eyes and turned my head as I drew it across her throat. I didn't feel anything, I didn't hear anything, and I didn't, re didn't turn back. I turned directly to the door and left. In fact, I was worried, as I explained to Mike and Greg, I was wor a little bit worried later thinking, I wonder if I did what I was supposed to. I was worried that I may, maybe hadn't taken the child's life. But the thing that re reassured me was, I recalled that fo directly after that, I walked into the bathroom and washed the knife off. And that was what reassured me as I reflected on that before I saw pictures or anything. And then, basically from there, I went in the kitchen, untied the uh, cord from Brenda's neck, and then I took her life. And then I turned to Ron, I said, okay, well, we can leave now. Well, I think we did go and, I did go and wash the knife off first, and then basically we left. Well, after Brenda and Erica were murdered, Ron instructed Knapp to drive to the next home on the hit list. He said that God told him to hit three places in a row in rapid succession. Well, Dan was fired up and full of adrenaline after having committed two homicides, and he almost shouted, let's go for it. The group laughed and said that the next target was a small woman and that she wouldn't be much of a problem. <laughs> after arriving at the next home, they broke in after cutting alarm wires with their knife. They were unable to locate their intended victim, though, and out of sheer anger, they destroyed the home. Now, before leaving, they stole a watch, some rings, and $100 in cash. In their frenzied condition, they drove right past their next target's home. By the time they figured it out, Carnes said to them, well, I guess your God doesn't want you to kill anyone else today. To which Ron replied, I guess not. Well, I want to break from my narrative and give you a chance to hear from this killer firsthand. It's actually a recording I made just a few months ago in prison with Dan Lafferty. Now, again, I've never shared these outside of law enforcement training, and recently Dan gave me permission to share it publicly. You know, I want you to know that I really have a, a high respect and, and care for you, and uh, that's why I'm glad that I'm getting a chance to talk to you, because I... I didn't write back. I did get your letter. I wanted you to know that. And I hadn't responded to it because I just hadn't felt quite right about it yet. And, and so this, may, this is good because now I can explain to you my feelings. Um, I, uh, a few years ago, it's been six or seven years now, I felt like I should not do any more interviews or even have visits. My family doesn't even come out to visit and I just explain to them that this is the way I feel right now. So I'm kind of incommunicado and that's just what I feel is the right thing. I've turned down several interviews, uh, especially after Ron died and that. You know, it's probably pretty unnerving for you to sit and listen to this killer as he calmly described what happened earlier. And now as I'm visiting with him, um, the thing that I think is so important is this predator's memory of the events as well as his resolve have never changed. He still maintains that what he did was inspired, and he feels that he's a prophet of God. He's never apologized for the crimes, and, and in his mind, at least in how he verbalizes it, he committed the murders because it was the right thing to do. <laughs> well, a few years after the murders, Dan and Ron's brother, Alan, the husband of the and father of the victims, asked, why why are you not asking for forgiveness or attempting to repent? Well, Dan's response to his brother then and still today is that he has no need to repent. He has nothing to repent of, and, and what he did, he was commanded to do. <laughs> well, some of you are undoubtedly unnerved by his looks even. When you see his face, his long beard, his jumpsuit, it's intimidating. You might even feel a little unsure, uneasy, or uncomfortable. And, and the monster you see, especially after knowing the elements of the crime, uh, really place your, your thoughts and mind in conflict. Dan Lafferty is articulate and educated. 
And, and keep in mind as you listen to him, he speaks confidently. This guy has been locked up in maximum security for the last 37 years. He speaks about these murders as if he's describing a routine activity, and he readily accepts responsibility for the crimes. He, he says that uh, what he whispered to the 14-month-old Erica in 1984, the quote, I don't understand why this is going to happen, and perhaps we'll talk about it in heaven someday, close quote, is really unnerving to listen to. But he, he comfortably says that the murders have never haunted him or bothered him. He calls it a strange phenomenon. Now, Dan's brother, Ron, died in prison a few years ago, but, but Dan doesn't think that he'll die in prison. <laughs> I think he will. If he does, and hopefully he will, he's perfectly happy in what he calls his uh, monastery. That's what he calls his prison cell, a monastery. He believes, though, that the walls will eventually fall to the ground and that he'll emerge as the biblical prophet Elijah. Even a few short months ago when we visited, he still said he, he doesn't feel comfortable in saying he's Elijah, but he knows that he is. Now, I'm going to share a part of the conversation I had with this killer just a few months ago. I, I want to preface it um, with this comment. I hope that Dan Lafferty is never released from prison. Now, I've been blessed in my life to to rarely find a predator that I didn't find some piece or part of that was likable. And I've always been blessed with the ability to separate their behavior, including murder, from their person. Now, what I mean by this is that I believe in accountability and holding people responsible for their behavior. Dan Lafferty and his brother are killers. They should have, uh, well, now Dan only, they should never see the light of freedom. The most important thing in this story is not them. It's the victim and the victims in this case. Now, that said, I found that I've been very successful over the years in getting uh, confessions from people because I try to understand what motivates them to commit the crime. Now, I don't condone their crimes nor attempt to somehow lessen them. I hope that this makes sense. And I, I, I just want to make sure that I don't get a bunch of angry emails from you about treating this offender with some kindness. I don't know any other way than that to get a confession. Now, make no mistake, though. I fully supported the death sentence that Ron Lafferty received. And I fully support the life sentence that Dan Lafferty got. Now listen, as I speak to him for the first time in 10 years. And, uh, I, during the trial, I said, you know, it's just God's business. I don't want to talk about it. And I don't feel like I should. But at a time, coincidental, if you believe in coincidence, uh, which I'm getting less and less <laughs> believing in, um, I felt that was time to explain. And with you guys, uh, with you especially, because you had a you have a real warm spirit, right? and I, I was opening up. And that was I'm glad of that, and that's able to I think share with you details that yeah, enabled yeah. you to be sure of what really happened, and uh, things that they were unable to connect together during the uh, during the uh, you know investigation and such. Well, as we talked, I asked Dan why he shared with me the things that he did especially things that he didn't bring out in the trial. You know, there were a number of appeals going on and his brother Ron was fighting his death sentence. I sat down on a number of occasions, again, sometimes over prison lasagna, uh, one, one or two times just in a room, one-on-one, -on -one, talking about his motivation for the murders and what kind of things law enforcement could learn about the criminal mind, especially the ritualistic criminal mind. Now, I think you're going to be interested in how he makes everything a decision after pondering and contemplating. Let's let's continue to listen. It's a really, we're at a very important moment right now. I still believe the things I've shared with you. And I appreciate when we were doing those uh, uh, profiling uh, experiences, I shared uh and you allowed me to share what I 
felt was necessary, uh, a necessary part of what we were doing from my point of view. And I remember I had openly told you that. I said, you may not think this is, well, I, I think the way I said it is, I don't think I really fit into the category that you're anticipating me to fill, but uh, that was a real important time for me to explain, like I say, things that I hadn't felt comfortable talking about prior to that. And I feel like they're about, we're so close to really important things. I think, in fact, this pandemic is kind of a foreshadowing of things. And there are other events that are taking place. And uh, but I'm still comfortable calling it my insanity, so uh, there's nothing about it that can offend me or anything. You'll notice as we were speaking, Lafferty began prophesying a little around the COVID thing. Now, remember, this guy thinks he's a prophet of his God, and I hope you're catching that I keep saying his God because I don't believe it's the same God you and I believe in. But for him, he believed that he was a prophet of God. He believed it in 1984. And he's never wavered from that belief. In fact, on one occasion, he told me that he received revelation in the same way that the biblical Moses received revelation. <laughs> I stared at him inquisitively. His response? He held his fingers to his mouth and imitated taking a drag for marijuana cigarettes. And he said, it came through a burning bush. Well, he, he feels that this is a very significant time, obviously, in the coronavirus. But as we spoke, I talked to him about the last 37 years in prison, how it's gone for him, what he thinks about the facts that he probably will die in prison. Let's let's listen into this. Been here 35 years now. Well, basically, I'm just, I believe God brought me here. This is why I call it my monastery. I call it the prison my monastery. And uh, this is where I got all my answers. Did 28 years in Max. They finally let me out of Max. I say I paroled to A Block. But right now I'm kind of, that's why I say it. I say, I'm just hanging out, waiting on God. I'm just camping out or hanging out, waiting on God. And that's really what I am. I feel like uh, I understand all the things that I needed to learn to uh, which is why I came here and more than that would probably get into things that I really don't want to talk about because I, I, I know I shared with you all the things that I felt I needed to at that time but I've learned a lot more about what I feel is happening and that may be I may be crazy there's a possibility I'm okay with that yeah so I help hey, hey and your your uh, eyebrows are getting pointier and longer <laughs> than your beard you is I that on there? You can see that? Yeah, I just let them go. Like the rest. Now, I don't know if you knew, but uh, between now and the time we were together, uh, I ended up cutting my hair and, and my beard and everything. But then uh, I felt the inclination to start growing it back again. And this time I didn't even cut my eyebrows. I'm letting everything do its own thing. People comment about my eyebrows and say, hey, they're, they're having a party. They're doing their own thing. I don't <laughs> <laughs> say, how do you make them go like that? I said, I don't make them go like that. that <laughs> well, as you can see, even though we're in adversarial positions, we somehow found a way to communicate and it gave me the opportunity to get the truth. I've never condoned his actions. He knows that. I've only tried to understand them. And then I fought for justice for the victims, something that I continue to do today. I then had a little fun and reminded Dan of a time when I loaded him into this state-owned airplane and I flew him to Phoenix to speak to a group of about a thousand investigators from across the country. I, I took a homicide investigator along with me to help me do security with Dan during the flight and while we were on the ground in Phoenix. This investigator and I had worked together for many, many years and he was a former concrete layer turned cop. I mean, he was huge. He was strong and firm in the way he did things, but he was also afraid to fly. And I didn't know that till we got on the plane. Now to set the stage in one of my interviews with Dan Laverty, he revealed to me that he believed again, that he was Elijah the prophet. And I asked him how he came to this realization. And he said that one day he heard his God declaring it. So then he got serious. And he looked at me intently and he said, 
the voice said to me, the moon will shine from noon till nine. <laughs> he leaned back in his chair and he raised his eyebrows, eyebrows kind of like, you know, there you go. You get it? I wanted to tell you that because it's kind of important in this next clip. Listen as I asked Dan what he remembers about getting out of maximum security for the first time in 20 years. He'd been down in the hole for 20 years. Imagine the sensory overload that that was. Let's listen in. Wow, it's hard to describe, really. It was like, uh, it was sort of like a dream, really. Uh, it was certainly enjoyable. And being up in the air, we flew around, we flew oh, over yeah. Grand Canyon. And I, I'll I tell you what I remember, and I don't know if you remember this. I had a huge police officer with me on the airplane. I, do I remember? Hell yes, I remember him. I really <laughs> liked him, but he sure his, didn't like flying. His, didn't nickname like flying. Was, his nickname was Grizz, and uh, he and I hired on at the police academy together. We're, we're up and we're flying, and there was a full moon outside, and this picture becomes very significant because Dan pointed out the window, and he said, look, the moon will shine from noon till nine. And I told Grizz about this experience that Dan had, and he he reached over and he said, Mr. Lafferty, if you do anything, I will kill you on this airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you, do you remember he hated flying? He, was he did he, hate flying. He was nervous as hell, and I was trying to be careful not to make him uncomfortable. But and I felt bad that I even said, you know, I was thinking about that just this morning. I said I should never have said anything about the moon because of that. And I, I actually saw your face drop a little. I said, don't worry, Mike, nothing's happening right now. Nothing's happening right now. But I, I, uh, I kind of wish I hadn't said anything, but. The year after Dan revealed that he believed he was Elijah the prophet, he actually drew me a pen and pencil drawing of a wolf howling at the moon in the daylight. Here's an image of that. He inscribed on the picture, the moon will shine from noon till nine. Well, I want to take a moment and share an interview that Ron and Dan Lafferty had after their preliminary hearing. Things like this usually don't happen nowadays, and this will give you a little more insight into their mindset. I, I believe it will help you also see a little bit of a power struggle that existed between the two brothers who would never talk to each other again after the trial. In fact, while they were waiting prosecution, Ron actually attempted to murder Dan from the adjacent jail cell. He would later attempt suicide by hanging in his cell, and this would lead to decades of, of long discussion about whether he was competent to stand trial or not. Let's, let's watch this uh, from uh, following the prelim, and think about this. This doesn't happen very often anymore. Let's watch. Well, uh, we're not disappointed with the proceedings today. We're pleased. We feel like we've been treated fairly. Uh, it's our intention, however, in the future, uh, and that we weren't able to do that today, but we would like to ask for a change of venue. At least at this point, we're still thinking that, because when it gets into the court procedure, we are fearful because of uh, the infringements in our personal lives over the past two years that we probably won't be treated fairly here. And that's, that, I don't mean to offend anyone personally, but uh, we have to take into consideration the infringements into our personal lives over the past two years. People have gone out of their way to make us uncomfortable, and we feel to like to undermine our marriages and that sort of thing. And for that reason, we just can't believe that uh, we would receive a, a, a fair uh, trial here in this area. We're literally involved, frankly, in the uh, preparations for the redeeming of Zion. That's literally what's uh, obviously, from the testimony and cross-examination today, That was those are the points of significance that I was focusing on, because that's literally what we're involved in. I really believe that Ron is a prophet of God and that he's a revelator and that we're, there's been revelation given and there's been prophecies and warnings made throughout the uh, scriptures and being fulfilled now. And I think the warning that he gave uh, is very appropriate uh, in warning all the people throughout this area and well, throughout the world, really. The times are upon us when there's going to be great calamities. and. We need to repent and put our lives in order. The same, pro the same revelations and directions of all the prophets. To repent. The brotherhood of the prophets seem to have lost, lost their faith. Does that seem more important to you than well, that? That's your more, counts of, uh, that was the only thing of importance that happened today in my concern. Revelation, my revelation that I received that was used as Exhibit 1 today in the court 
uh, does not command anyone to take the life of anyone, and it's been called my hit list, and in, in fact it is not my hit list. What does it, what does it say then? It names certain individuals and, uh, and names... Among them Brenda and Eric Alassie? Yes, as a matter of fact, yes. And uh, those individuals, uh, uh, God said, were in some way holding up the work, and, and don't ask me to clarify it because I don't know the end result of it. Uh, you'll have to get on your knees and ask God. <laughs> if you want to know the answer to that, and that's all I can really say about it. Well, I can't say that I don't really care, because I do. I feel that uh, the Lord has taught me some important things, and I'd like to share them. But, uh, and I couldn't do that if I, my life was taken. And so, so I do care, yes. But my main concern, you're correct, my main concern is the fact that uh, uh, I would like not to see you people involved in that destruction, and I wish people would listen. And it's, this is not uncommon. It's, it's history repeating itself, and if God has asked me to give that warning, why, I'm willing to do it at the cost of my life. Would you no. consider yourself martyrs if it came down to where you lost your lives over this, this issue? Uh, no more than any other prophets that have ever lived on the earth? Really hadn't thought of that. I don't, that's not our intention. I'd like to respond to the question over here, what really is on trial? You're on trial, and we're on trial, because this whole mortal probation is a trial. And that's what really is on trial. It's not the issue that uh, is catching everyone's attention, that's just... Uh, Frankly, that's a lot of uh, emotion and uh, uh, distraction from reality. Do you feel a great deal of remorse for your brother Alan? A great deal of remorse? Uh, I can't say that I feel a great deal of remorse for my brother Alan, no. Having lost his wife and his child, do you, I mean, uh, said he's got to be in a lot of inner turmoil. Mm -hmm. Do you feel sorry for him? And then... Well, uh, I have compassion for him, yes. He's my brother, I love him. But life has to go on. But life has to go on, that's correct. We can't stop. We all have tribulation in our lives. It's unfortunate, but it's if, part of a process. Return, would God give a revelation to murder? Would he? Has he ever? He's given revelations to destroy entire civilizations. Well, Ron and Dan Lafferty were ultimately convicted for the murders of Brenda and Erica Lafferty. Ron received the death penalty. He died in prison. Dan received life without parole. Now, I don't want my casual interview style with Dan to alarm any of you. My interviews are all about law enforcement and how we can better understand ritual fanaticism and this concept of ritual murder. Now, you, you can actually learn more about my thoughts about ritualism and cults and, and recruiting tactics and everything by reading my book, Deceived. In there, we talk about cult behaviors, and I explore that with some of the world's experts. It's a great book. I hope you'll pick it up. It talks about religious fanaticism, and uh, I think it fits nicely with the discussion we're having here. But this is about preventing other kinds of similar crimes. And in my opinion, the Lafferty case will always be about the death of Erica and Brenda the way in which they suffered at the hands of two psychopathic personality types. My work has never been about those two. In fact, in this final clip, you're going to see where I actually call out how hard we work to keep Dan in prison. And my final question for Dan is the one that I think many of you are wondering, did he ever have any remorse for what he did to Brenda and Erica? On all this, we've had a, a really interesting relationship that has clearly been on two different sides of an issue. Yeah. But, uh, we, we've sure. always had an honest relationship. And yeah. I, I mean, I, I worked awfully hard to keep you where you are, but I, like you say, we're working. The way I say it is we work on the opposite sides of the fence and that's okay. We can come up the fence and talk, <laughs> but we don't, <laughs> we're limited to what we can pass back and forth through the fence. <laughs> but well and i hope you're okay i uh i continue yeah. to share the things i learned from you uh, in our earlier interviews um i would like to even be able to share what i have just learned today about how things have been for you the past while are you okay with that here's what i'm gonna tell you because of my respect for you and do what you feel comfortable now if you go to do something and you get an uncomfortable feeling i think you can relate to that then don't do anything that makes you uncomfortable. If you feel comfortable doing what you feel, then don't worry about it. Before you leave, have you ever had any remorse for uh, killing Brenda and Erica? That's a fair question, but no. It's just like I said before, I have not had any bad feelings about that. I'm confident that what I did was 
part of the plan. It's part of a plan. That's the easiest way to say it, I guess. And therefore, you know, my life was my life was preserved. I thought I was gonna be executed, and in fact, I was a little disappointed when I wasn't because I was looking forward to get my answers from God. But this is where I'm thinking. I'm just repeating what I've told you before. But now I'm confident. This is where I was meant to come to get my answers, and that's why I call it my monastery. <laughs> At the point of the mountain, I like the image. The image, of course, it's not quite the point of the mountain like we the image implies. But uh, yeah, I've gotten the answers I need, and I'm very blessed, very happy, and patiently now waiting for. This is the way I see it. God brought me here to get the information I needed. I've got it now. I'm waiting for him to get me out. All right. All right. And if I don't Thanks, see, Dan. if I don't see you soon, I'll see you when the moon shines from noon to nine. Thank you. <laughs> In the end, interviewing Dan Lafferty provided a lot of information that improved investigation techniques across the country. More than 1,500 violent crime investigators heard firsthand how a ritual cult can begin and be sustained. We learned how important it is to understand the family dynamic at the time of the crime and, frankly, informative years. We learned how cult leaders give members perceived or actual positions of importance. And we learned how cults keep their members engaged with this us versus them mindset. Not only does it improve the chances that they won't stray from the cult's doctrine, but it creates a sense of elitism. We learned more about the strategies these cult leaders employ to recruit new members and we gained further understanding as to how they justify breaking the law. Remember, Dan justified what would have been sexual abuse by saying his God wanted him to marry his 14-year-old daughter. He also justified murdering two individuals by saying he was only doing what God ordered. Both Lafferty's mitigated questions of mental health, and they replaced it with comments of spiritual elitism. And their crimes teach us more about how a pack mentality can lead to further victimization. This was so evident by their rabid enthusiasm as they um, committed the crimes against Brenda and Erica, and then were so excitedly hunting for their next victim. And don't forget that sawed-off shotgun. They justified it was their manna from heaven to eliminate any police officer who stood in their way. Now, many people have wondered why the brothers never spoke again after the crimes. In part, it had to do with the prison system that separates them from each other. But for Dan Lafferty, the reasons became much more compelling. You see, he related this story to me one evening. He said that as the two of them sat in the Utah County Jail awaiting trial, that Ron called Dan to the iron bars that separated the two jail cells. You know, back in those days, they didn't have a solid wall between the jail cells. They just had bars between them. Ron confided in Dan that he had received revelation that he was supposed to kill Dan. <laughs> well, true to his wacky nature, Dan replied, well, Ron, I'd have to pray about that. But how do you think you'd do it? Ron replied, I think I'd have to have you stand with your back to these bars, pointing to those bars down the middle of the jail cells, and he motioned his hands, bringing Dan toward him. Well, not considering what might actually happen, Dan complied, and he stood with his back at the separation. Suddenly, Ron threw a towel around his neck, and he pulled violently against the bars. Dan fought for his life but he realized he was losing the battle. The last thing he recalled was blacking out and thinking, well, at least I'll get to go to heaven and get answers from God about whether killing Brenda and the baby was the right thing to do. I don't know about this. Well, the room went dark. Dan passed out, and he assumed that he was dying. He thought to himself, at least I'm going to get this answer from God about it, whether or not it was the right thing to do. And he closed his eyes for what he believed would be the last time. Well, to his surprise, he woke up a little while later, 
And for him, something very revelatory happened. He opened his eyes and he saw Ron crying in the corner of his jail cell, assuming that he had murdered his brother. When Ron realized that Dan was alive, he rejoiced. <laughs> and then, after gaining his composure, Ron instructed Dan to place his back against the bars one more time so that he could complete the task of murdering him. <laughs> well, Dan was outraged, and after screaming at Ron for some time, he, he committed that the two of them would never talk again, and they haven't. It was then that Dan confided in me that he really does think Ron is crazy. <laughs> Holy cow. Well, folks, you just can't make this stuff up. Dan then said, you know, the Bible teaches you to be forgiving, to turn the other cheek and to do seven times 70. <laughs> I asked Dan, so does that mean you forgave him? And he said, swearing, blankety blank, no. <laughs> that turn your other cheek doctrine is a bunch of BS. So there you go, the Lafferty's. Here's my question for you. Does it bother you that I created this uh, non-adversarial relationship with this ritualistic killer? I mean, how do you feel about the way in which I was able to extract information from him? Is it helpful for law enforcement, perhaps even the public, to hear how a predator like this thinks? Uh, is it helpful to know how they select their victims or how they plan their crimes? I'm going to be looking for your thoughts below, and I hope that you will call it like it is. This is a terribly tough position that investigators get put in when they look at these violent crimes, especially when they interview. You can't allow your emotions or your hatred to get in the way of soliciting confessions or admissions. Well, I hope you'll hit the like and the subscribe button, ring the bell so that you get and receive all the notifications when I release videos like this one. And I want to thank you for your support of Profiling Evil. Would you please consider joining our channel memberships and, and uh, think about sharing our channel with your contacts out there. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.